Now I have co-host power. Great. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last uh, uh, panel of Generation Analog 2022. Um, this is the last co uh, constituted panel. There'll be a longer break, and then we will have the second and final keynote of, uh, of the conference. Uh, so look for that. Uh, that's 7 p.m. Eastern time, I believe. And then after the keynote, don't forget, there will be a super secret speakeasy hangout time. Uh, same Zoom um, right after. Uh, you're, you're free to bring your, your preferred beverage and perhaps something, uh, a pet or whatever, to show and tell if you'd like. Um, so uh, my name is Edmund Chang. I am an assistant professor of English uh, at Ohio University. I've already introduced myself before. I work on all sorts of nerdy things. Uh, please ask me, please inquire within if you are interested. And I'll introduce my co-moderator. Hello all, I'm Izzy Williams. I'm with the University of California, Irvine. I'm in my third year of my doctorate program in culture and theory. And I study um, blackface and monstrosity in games. Awesome. So uh, let's just jump into it. Panel number seven is intersectionality in tabletop games. And up first is Chandler Jennings uh, on repeating the repeating island towards an experience of Caribbean storytelling through tabletop play. You're muted. And also, if you keep like gallery up or chat up, I will give you your time warnings. Perfect. Can you see the screen OK? All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Chandler. I'm an MA student in English at the University of Virginia. Uh, I actually mainly work on questions of politics, race, and critique in fringe American religious formations. And this is my first foray into a games and game studies space, but it's been really awesome so far. So thanks for having me. Um, so in this presentation, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about my card game prototype, The Repeating Island, uh, as a way to explore some interesting theoretical connections among Caribbean literary and game studies. Uh, you can see a little presentation roadmap here. So first of all, why use a game to explore forms of Caribbean storytelling? So first, ludic energy and public play are really important in Caribbean culture. So Maria Cozart Riccio argues that one of the most important effects of Carnival is, quote, creating through the power of play a potent affirmation of emancipation itself. So Carnival firmly centers the importance of play over and against a history of forced labor. Public play visibly performs liberation from the strictures of plantation time, collectively affirming people's sovereignty to govern their own times of work and leisure. And so inspired by C.T. Nguyen's argument about games as inscribing human agency, I began to wonder whether it was possible to create a politically oriented game experience using Caribbean storytelling play as like a sort of conceptual framework. Uh, so it turns out that there are a couple of existing games that sort of helped me frame my approach. Uh, the most direct inspiration is a game called Afro Rhythms from the Future by Dr. Lonnie Brooks and Eli Kosminski. So in this game, players work collaboratively towards imagining a liberatory Black future by overcoming obstacles and creating hybrid conceptual material tools. Another inspiration is the game Sign by Catherine Himes and Hakan Seyalioglu, which essentially asks players to collaboratively invent a brand new sign language from scratch with no speaking. This one is a little less explicitly political, but it does an awesome job of foregrounding how language and communication both work and frequently fail. My game is partly an attempt to synthesize aspects of these two. I want to maintain both the political focus and the attention on language by giving players the experience of uh, the political and epistemological stakes of storytelling as informed by Caribbean studies work. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more later. So first let's talk about the game a little bit. Um, in its current form, the repeating island consists of 180 cards divided into 12 categories. Uh, the categories are drawn from Barbadian poet Kamau Brathwaite's seminal 1996 talk, Notes on Caribbean Cosmology. Uh, in the talk, he outlines 12 interconnected aspects of Caribbean cosmology that mutually support and reinforce one another. 
So each card in the game includes a quote from a Caribbean source text. Together, the quotes across all of the cards make up the set of signs that are used to play the game. In my current prototype, I drew the quotes from a mix of Caribbean folktales, fiction, and theory and philosophy, um, 19 texts in all. Um, these source texts are not determinate by any means. You could just as easily create a version of this game using different source texts or a different set of quotes. Um, you can also see here a citation chart that shows um, the, 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 a brief overview of the sources and how they're divided into the categories. So the game's mechanics are quite simple. Um, the objective is for each player to build an island comprised of one of each of the 12 kinds of card, so a full cosmology. Um, at the beginning of the game, all the cards are laid down and face down in front of the players, creating the soup of signs or draw pool. Um, soup of signs is a phrase taken from Caribbean theorist Antonio Benitez Rojo. Each kind of card has two aspects, a play condition and a play effect. Um, the play condition must be met in order for a player to add that card to their island. The play effect is what happens after the card is then played. So many of the play conditions involve what I call weaving in homage to um, Anansi the Spider. Um, so weaving is the central narrative mechanism of the game. It involves making some sort of connection among a certain set of cards that have already been played into players' islands. So this connection can be narrative, phonetic or sonic, rhythmic or metric, thematic, oppositional, or any other kind of connection that a player can think of. In the context of the game, weaving is meant to be an improvisational act of storytelling or interpretation that basically just makes an argument that that card deserves to be added to the player's island. So all attempts at weaving are either shouted up or shouted down by the group. There's no formal voting. The group decides by informal and intentionally ill-defined consensus, and shouting will look different in each group. The game requires both competition and collaboration um, and is explicitly about navigating the social space through storytelling. In fact, the win condition of the game requires that at least two people always share victory. And so at its best, the game should be a raucous and vocal sequence of improvised stories and connections and interpretations with spirited disagreement and passionate argument. So I've tried to link each quote and each of the, of the game effects to that aspect of the Caribbean cosmology that it best encapsulates. So for instance, one of the Anansi cards has the quote, she builds with eaves and buttresses like a cathedral. So this quote alludes to the trope of Anansi narrating her own past into existence um, and also to the trickery of reappropriating the structural elements of a cathedral towards a new and probably ambiguously sacred end. Um, finally, the quote also contains a grammatical ambiguity that Anansi might exploit. It can be read as if the eaves and buttresses that she builds are similar to those found in the cathedral, or it can be read as she builds eaves and buttresses like a cathedral builds eaves and buttresses. Um, so this is just one, one example of, of the way that I've tried to sort of match the, um, match the quotes and the effects to the, to the cosmological categories. So um, to play um, the Anansi card into your island, you just have to weave it with three existing cards into your island, that is to narrate its path into existence. Um, if the attempt at weaving is shouted up by the group, Anansi, the trickster that she is, can steal a card from an opponent's island. Um, so by the end of the game, players will have had to create narrative connections in many different combinations among all of the cards in their island, as well as between their island's cards and the cards in the other player's islands. So these narrative connections bind the islands together in a sort of web of meaning, but they're also inherently unstable because each card has to be woven many times in many different connections. Any given interpretation or story that's told in the process of, a, of an attempt at weaving is always layered with many other interpretations. So there's kind of a dizzying set of narrative relationships that run through the game and bind everything together. So the goal of all this is to offer players a personal experience of Caribbean storytelling play and literary theory. Um, so in a way, the three interventions that I'll talk about are closely related to one another. So separating them out is a little bit artificial, but it kind of helps to structure the presentation. So uh, making that gesture. The first intervention is that the game invites its players to reshape their idea of what the Caribbean is through a playful encounter with Caribbean texts. So in this intervention, I draw heavily on Antonio Benitez Rojo's 1992 book, The Repeating Island, which also gave the game its title. 
Benitez Rojo offers a kind of post-structuralist reading of Caribbean history. So in his understanding, the Caribbean archipelago is what he calls a repeating island, a set of islands comprised of signs that are so historically and culturally dense, that's where the phrase soup of signs comes from, as to contain the traces and rhythms of all global modernity. So a machine of machines, he calls it, um, that fueled the European imperial project, saw the birth of capitalism and the plantation economy, uh, was the crossroads of the economic world for centuries and whose goods produced by enslaved labor uh, traveled around the globe. And today we, we all live in the ongoing aftermath of this. Um, so there's a quote from Benitez Rojo here that ex explicates some of it, but I'm just gonna move on. Um, so for Benitez Rojo, the, the Caribbean as a set of signs is a kind of metonym for capitalist modernity. It stands in for it. If that's the case, then works of fiction and theory by Caribbean writers and scholars offer a kind of counter narrative, a metonym for the metonym that remixes the soup of signs and exposes the terror and trauma at the heart of modernity while also exploring liberatory possibilities for the future. The game, in turn, adds another intertextual level to this chain of transmission. So players create islands from stories that are built from quotes that are drawn from texts that themselves are cultural representations of this idea of the repeating island. So each textual island in the game that players are playing with uh, represents one particular instantiation of this um, high level idea of the repeating island. Um, Benitez Rojo uses the phrase with no center and no boundary to, to explain how this works. Um, and so there's echoes all the way back up the metonymic chain until you get to the geographical, historical, and cultural islands that are located in the real world. So there's this sequence of representation that connects all of these different levels. Uh, and the game offers this representationally complex engagement with the centrality of Caribbean history to the history of modernity. And all of this is mediated through literary signs, these quotes, and the uh, player's active storytelling. The second intervention has to do with foregrounding citation as a political practice. So this idea comes from Black Studies and Caribbean Studies scholar Catherine McKittrick, who writes about the ethics of the transmission of knowledge and ideas. The game design of the repeating island encourages players to engage citationally with the game's text sources. Um, so the gameplay places the words of Caribbean authors in the mouths of the players, asking them to build compelling connections and advocate for their particular interpretations. The quotes in the game are well cited. There's no mistaking whose words they are. Um, but by placing them up against each other in unexpected ways, players build connections and ideas alongside the source texts in a collaborative meaning-making process. It's like a remixed encounter with words, figures, and ideas. So this is important because it maintains the focus on the signs um, that constitute the raw material of the game, even as they're reimagined and remixed across different players' interpretations. And of course, players are free to make any connection they wish, but the source texts shape and focus the kinds of connections that are available. So the third intervention that I wanna talk about has to do with the stakes around narrative form. So the game intervenes on the level of narrative interpretation. Um, the gameplay experience is based on interpreting signs, close reading texts, and seeking unexpected meaning in fragments of language. So in this way, the intellectual work that the game demands is not that different from the academic work of literary interpretation. Both are seeking meaning in texts. They just approach the process in entirely different ways. So academic literary interpretation often creates distance between the scholar and the object of interpretation. The text is meant to be dissected, parsed, unpacked, explicated, critiqued. Scholars deploy a hermeneutics of suspicion, as it's called in Rudafelsky's sense. By contrast, the repeating island encourages an interpretive mode characterized by performance, closeness, and presence. Players speak the words of the text out loud, echoing aural and sonic Caribbean cultural formations such as Antumpan, Calypso, Carnival, and so on. My gambit is that a form of vocal storytelling play might enable um, certain kinds of interpretation or interpretive practice that normative disciplinary forms of academic criticism cannot. Um, the game also rejects a hegemonic understanding of the human as a strictly biological rational subject by tying narrative agency to storytelling place instead of character. So in fact, the recipe for success in the game is intentionally non-rational. It's group consensus, a form of intersubjectivity and not rational individualism that leads to success. Players become storytellers narrating place into existence the game values cleverness, wit, laughter, improvisation, emotional payoff over teleological and capitalistic ends like resource management, area control, quest completion, and so on. 
So as players build their islands, acts of storytelling, narrative and interpretation are shown to be world making rather than subject forming. That is in constructing islands out of words, the game tries to unveil how the stories that we tell about the world are in a very real way, precisely that which makes the world the way it is. So as Sylvia Winter says, we are simultaneously biological and storytelling beings. So I've got some limitations here that I would discuss, but I'm running out of time. Um, the main thing is that I want to be able to broaden the reach of the game, um, and I need to balance the play effects a little bit better, and that as a non-Caribbean person, I need to make sure that I'm not un, uh, unwittingly commoditizing or commercializing um, the effects, um, the, the play effects that I'm trying to describe. Um, so just more, more thought and more nuance and more conversation will benefit this. And then, yeah, I just want to say that uh, it's been lovely being here and um, all of my, I'm freely happy to freely share all of my materials um, for the game. If you want to continue talking about this, uh, feel free to send me an email. Um, I'd love to hear from you and yeah, thanks so much. That's great, amazing. That's a lot of work. Um, awesome, let's keep moving. Yes, so great job. And next up we have Julia Mirsch presenting how safety and belonging are becoming a concern for queer Germans while board gaming. Take it away. Thank you. Let's get that up here. I do not have the chat window. Oh, there. Perfect. Okay. I'm ready. <laughs> um, yeah, so I want to talk about queer Germans and the rules of the board game table. If I look a bit tired, it's because it's past 10 p.m. in Germany. Um, yeah. I will talk about myself a little bit later, but first I want to read a small story. And it goes like this. <laughs> Imagine one of your friends invited you to their favorite board game store. Although the shop is unimpressive from the outside, the welcoming experience waits within. All shelves are full to the brim with different games. The coffee fragrance emits from a tiny machine. There are snacks for sale and there are stairs leading to a historic basement with an arched ceiling. Turns out, that the basement is actually a place for the communal playing area. A central figure is the owner, a woman with a warm smile who welcomes and greets everyone who steps through, through the door. It feels like coming home and you will spend many more nights at this game shop in the future. This experience was actually my first experience as a game, um, in a game store. And after I moved, I had to painfully learn that this is not the um, standard experience to be in a game store. And um, I reflected onto my game store experiences and it seemed obvious that feeling safe and welcome played a critical role for my access to board gaming as a queer person. And as others have addressed in many different voices, there are difficulties that you encounter if you're not a white cis man. As a small background after that story for, to myself, um, I'm Julia Mirsch and um, this is me in my friend group. Um, <laughs> I am the person who brings all the games to the game nights, sometimes uninvited, sometimes invited. And um, I recently finished my gender and diversity degree in Kleve in Germany and I wrote my thesis on board games. And that was actually inspired by last year's Generation Analog, where I um, attended talks by Paul Booth and Tanya Obuda. And uh, so it's very exciting to be on this panel, especially today. Mm. Yeah. And after I, I read a bit into the research on analog game studies, and I discovered there's not that much literature on who plays games, especially not um, for the German region. So I decided to contribute a little bit. And my research aim was, does a queer identity impact your relationship with the board game hobby? And if so, how? 
Um, yeah. I read Paul Booth's book, Board Games as Media, and I then decided I could also decide the design uh, online survey. And I first wanted to base my survey purely on, on his survey, but I encountered some obstacles. This is my progress. Um, first, I learned that I do not want to address the hobby board gamers. I wanted to address my friends who um, are more on the casual side, who only play when, when I bring the games. So I had to tone down the hobby specific language um, a lot and I instead focused on more the emotional part and the experiences of board gaming. Then I also had to um, change the ways how you share the survey because I personally did not know anybody who had a profile profile on Board Game Geek. So I, I in the end, made one to share my survey. Um, and then I chose these three different spaces. I shared my survey in Board Game Spaces on Board Game Geek, the German regional specific page, um, a Discord, Facebook, and so on, in queer spaces, um, especially Instagram, like artists and um, queer influencers. And then on, in the neutral spaces, like just personal connections, friends, and their extended contacts. Mm, and for my survey specifically, Instagram seemed to be a really good way to generate new responses. Mm, yeah, after the two months that the survey was open, I had 473 participants um, that I could work with, with their data I could work. However, my, my background is in gender studies. So I did not want to put my, my participants into the categories of um, male students and, cis and female students. So I still needed groups to compare. So I grouped them in non-queer and queer people. So the, um, yeah. So the non-queer group would be people that adhere to the social norm social norm of being um, cis gendered and heterosexual and only that so that's 73 percent of my participants and the other 27 percent would be um, queer people who would be opposing this social norm so if a person told me they are they identify as female and non-binary and heterosexual they would be sorted in that queer group for my for my research and to have this 27% of queer people in my study seemed kind of a lot because the official numbers of um, a Germany's population of people identifying as part of the LGBTQI plus community is only 2%. Um, yeah, I do, of course, have some general assessments about my participants. Um, so nearly 60% identified only as cis male, 33% as cis female. I grouped the other identities together um, because they're very, very diverse in their uh, expressions. And um, this is a yeah, similar thing for the sexuality part. So the large majority identified as only heterosexual, but we also have a lot of people um, identifying as bisexual or with multiple identities. But I want to talk about the, the two groups and um, how they compare. And I want to start with the similarities. I want to describe um, what my participants stated, what is the German board gamer. So the similarities between those two groups is that both started playing during childhood. So they were um, in, in traject um, they started playing while they were children and they basically never stopped. They might have had a break, but later rediscovered the hobby um, uh, easily. Both groups play to be social, to have fun, and to be challenged by the game, which was pretty much identical to what um, Paul Booth in the study also found. Both groups rate feeling safe as a very important and feel safe, feel safer with um, friends than with new people. And both groups say they condemn rude and disrespectful behavior 
around the table. I have a quote uh, about that from a non-queer group participant. They say unacceptable behaviors are damaging cards or materials, sticky fingers, folding cards, throwing stuff, etc. Insults or bullying others because of a move for winning or losing does not belong at the gaming table or in everyday life. Here I like that they make the statement that what is rude around the, the gaming table is also rude in everyday life and just should, uh, should be avoided. However, um, there were some major differences between my two groups and I want to focus here on the queer group. So the queer participants said they play less frequently and they buy fewer, fewer games. Um, they're younger and less highly educated, which might be connected, these two things. Um, they also focus on the social experience rather on the specific games. So they would say they want to have fun with their friends and they would not say, oh, for my perfect game night, I have to start at 10 a.m. and then we play for six hours the specific strategy game. Um, the queer group also plays less in public locations or with new people. So um, the queer people would say that they actually almost only play with their friends. Um, they also say that they're placing more importance on the feeling of belonging than the non-queer group and they feel less safe with new people and highlight the unsafe social interactions as negative experiences. So I asked them in an open question to um, describe their negative experience while, while gaming. And many people said like bending cards or losing a game piece because somebody was not careful enough. Um, but this was much more um, prevalent for the non-queer group and the queer people would say they had personal attacks um, happening at the gaming table and therefore would not um, go to a public location anymore. I do have another quote from a queer participant on this. Um, they say, I have never had a good experience playing games with new people at a board game store. They were not very welcoming. I felt either ignored by the group because they were all friends and only talked with each other, or they were awkward, gross, or creepy men just talking to me because I'm a girl. Here, this participant also addresses the level of misogyny that female presenting people sometimes encounter in public gaming locations. There were many such comments also, but it's not the, the topic of the talk. That's why I'm just glossing over that fact. Yeah, um, I did make a short summary of my, of my points. Um, and what I want you to remember is that the German board gamers in my study started playing during childhood and foster a lifelong hobby. I think that ties nice to the educational panel we had earlier that people um, have maybe a harder time discovering games later in life. And yeah, the second thing is that board gaming might be a popular hobby for queer people. Um, very prevalent from the last panel, which was fantastic. And also because of my, my numbers, like 27% queer people, if there's only 2% in the general population, um, could be also because of my distribution strategy, of course, but it seemed kind of telling. Um, yeah, and while all players condemn rude social behaviors, queer people are extra vulnerable and make their own safe zones. So they will st stay together. They will only play with friends because they know they're safe with them and they will stay at home or at, at some other safe space where they can actually express this at themselves without um, fearing any discrimination or loot behaviors. Mm. Yeah, I do have a small bonus tip. And this is, I ask people for their favorite or for their ideal game night. And um, the answers were quite, um, quite different. Like I wasn't expecting it. I was just like, oh yeah, my perfect experience is obviously the perfect experience for everybody else, which is not true. And um, yeah, so if you're playing with new people, you might want to um, 
express uh, what kind of expectations you have on to for that game night because yeah everybody was also very direct on not inviting people anymore if they didn't feel like they fit into the group and then you shall not pass yeah that's it for my presentation thank you for the attention and i am looking forward for the q a wonderful thank you Julia. um all right moving on um up next we have uh tanya boboda uh, on contested spaces, velvet ropes, exclusion zones, uh, which will be a nice tie in the pleasures and dangers of face to face play in analog gaming spaces. Okay, great. Uh, hopefully, you can see my slides okay. Um, Julia, that was spectacular. That was, I, we, we need to talk. This is, this is such good stuff. So, my, my talk is called Can Contested spaces, velvet ropes, exclusion zones, the pleasures and dangers of face-to-face -face play in analog gaming spaces. Um, so I'm just gonna take you through. So my big goal with this is to create a bit of an empirical level set of what the state of representation is looking at Board Game Geek most prim uh, primarily. And what I did was I journeyed straight into the heart of Board Game Geek, as you'll see with a lot of my measures. Um, and what I was trying to do is, you know, locate a pattern. Is there a pattern in terms of the representation that we're seeing in games and what is kind of the level set of the labor dynamics in board games currently as defined by board game geek rank games? And what is the representation on the boxes themselves? So Consolva wrote her, you know, uh, admonishment to game studies scholars to look for patterns, uh, particularly around misogyny and patriarchy in gaming spaces. And so that's what I'm doing 20 years hence. Okay, so this is, you know, and again, hopefully you can see all of this, but this is um, kind of this, the state of play uh, with Board Game Geek, the top 400 ranked games. So Analog Game Studies was kind enough to publish one of my first studies in 2018, where I found that of the top 200 games, 93.5% of the designers that labor pool was a white man in this case, um, with this top 400 board game geek rank games with a data poll in 2020, in the late part of 2020, what I discovered is 92.6% of all of the labor uh, responsible for board, uh, board game design in that top 400 were uh, white men. And then we've got almost a little Pareto's uh, uh, law here with the, the the representation on the, the board game cover. So I decided to punish myself and do a very rigorous analysis of all of the board game figures counted every single sheep, cow, goat, bird, every single one of them um, multiple times. And what I discovered is of the human representation, um, it really over over represents whiteness and maleness. So we've got an almost 80 20 slightly more than 80 percent split of BIPOC black indigenous person of color presenting figures versus white and then we have um, maleness uh, boys and men representation at 76.8 percent uh, with a compare and contrast of 23.2 percent a girl or a woman okay so you've got that real um, over orientation of whiteness and maleness in cover art representation and it's true to say that uh women you're more likely to see a creature that does not exist uh, an orc uh, a dragon um, than you would to see a human woman uh, represented on cover art okay and one of the, the big things that we talk a lot about as game scholars is you know who makes the thing uh really matters um, in terms of the stories that are told um, there tends to be a little bit of a problem that's often identified in, in video game design. It's getting quite a bit better now where it's a lot of recursion, a lot of, you know, this worked before, so let's spit out another first person shooter. Um, and what you've got is a, a challenge with design empathy. Um, so I, I teach a course in design thinking and a lot of it is talking to people about the audience is not you. Right, it's something I'm quite passionate about. And when you create things for your affinity group, it tends to keep people in that affinity group 
involved and excludes others, right? So who designs things matters. And so there, there are some barriers and gates in terms of accessing board gaming uh, play spaces, as well as the games themselves. Do they appeal to a broader um, audience? So, and Julia, your work is so spectacular. I, again, need to speak to you. I did a very focused um, call for online survey completion. And I made this behemoth survey of uh, so many questions, so many questions. Uh, a lot of people um, slogged through 120 questions about their board game habits. I got the biggest traction on Board Game Geek, oddly enough. And you're going to see that the diversity of the sample that I collected strictly with mostly participation from Twitter, Board Game Geek, and Reddit to a lesser degree. And then I did some qualitative interviews as well. And what I got back was quite surprising. Um, I got 78. 73.8% uh, participation from North, North America, mostly in their 30s and 40s, 60.4% identified as women, that includes trans women, 25.3% uh, identified as men, um, lots and lots of gender diversity in the sample. What I did was I asked people to just share their gender identification, then I did a, 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 an analysis based on that, so I didn't provide prescriptive radio buttons or anything like that. 20.4% identified as Black, Indigenous, or person of color, 52.8% identified as LGBTQ+. Um, and one of the things I did with the, the, the design of this, the study, um, so you can see a little bit more stats here, I'm not going to go into those, one of the big things about this particular study design was I really wanted to create a sense of psychological safety, because a lot of the things that were being shared with me were quite sensitive in nature. And, you know, almost trying to replicate uh, like a whisper network to say, share your stories with me, it's safe to do so, you are completely confidential and anonymous. And, you know, this kind of the catalyst for creating a lot of this, this psychological safety in the research design is one quote that I, I happened upon when I started this research, which is that the board game industry is the industry of missing stairs, where women confided their concerns in speaking out for fear of losing opportunities, of networks close to them, of platforms removed from them, all because of a temerity to speak up. And that's from Angelus Morningstar. And, you know, the, another thing, again, just looking at the way in which, you know, some of the discourses around board games and particularly the heart of the hobby community can be very fraught, very dangerous. And I can certainly speak to that as well in terms of the kinds of backlash that happen as a result of sharing this kind of analysis, providing these numbers can be quite dangerous. So, you know, this is a quote from Eric Lang talking about the fact that most minority creators have battle scars so deep, I'm surprised they're still out, they're still here making video games or making games and video content. We have to balance our need for personal justice and the need to work. So it's very, very difficult to engage critically with the board game industry and with the hobby community without it being a, a very, very off, often dangerous thing to do. So that importance around psychological safety. And I got a lot of comments, a lot of enthusiasts talked about the fact that they do some online research before they enter board game spaces, which is really the heart of this talk. And a lot of people will look for different online communities to see, should I go to this game event? Should I go to this game store? And this was very common as, as a trope within the qualitative feedback in the survey that this individual said they started by participating in online discussions, going to board game geek, and realizing that the community might not seem particularly welcoming as a result. So they said, you know, I've mostly disengaged with the community itself for this reason, because people push back so hard and so, so um, in, in such a vocal and outspo outspoken way when matters of representation are discussed at all. So this person said, I still love uh, games and I still buy and play them, but I do so privately in small groups of friends I trust. And Julia, your research is exactly as mine that it's a very carefully curated process and a lot of just julie exactly what you had said is seven in ten of my respondents of that full pool said that this and one person actually put a really fine point on it it said it's a hobby permeated permeated by obnoxiousness seven in ten said they have experienced the incivility trash talk being interrupted talked over and treated rudely uh, one in three of the survey participants said that they had reported experiencing 
unwelcome sexual advances while participating in that board gaming hobby. One in three experienced uh, and agreed or strongly agreed that they have experienced homophobic remarks while engaging in that board game hobby. And one in three said that when they attempted to engage in board game topics online, they have received online threats, insults, and rude messages. That's a huge problem. And one of my research participants talked at length about the fact that this is a real risk management issue for the entire hobby and community and sector in terms of growth. And this was an interesting finding. And a lot of, um, there was a trope in a lot of the qualitative discussions about how they avoid you know, traditional gaming events, stores, uh, friendly local game stores, um, conventions for this reason. So before the global pandemic, I tended to avoid public events and got, you know, a fair level, almost, uh, you know, um, strongly agree at 13% and 23%, 23.4% uh, agreeing. And this is of a very bought in, very invested group of hobbyists who said they have 11 years or more but the majority had 11 years or more in the hobby and are committed board game geek um, members who have profiles and vote on games etc so that's a very interesting finding of that core hardcore group you've got people opting out of public events for these reasons that's a real imperative for the sector this is another uh, qualitative uh, piece of feedback. I had so many stories shared with me. This is as a female and a mother. It's really sad when we open games and the character selection is almost exclusively male and white. My nine year old daughter picks on that up on that right away. It turns her off on specific games that when this mom reads the rules, she changes the pronouns used for gaming events and get togethers. I'm old and conf I'm old enough and confident that I can make space for myself to feel comfortable but it's still hard feeling comfortable and welcomed in a male dominated space. Um, this was an, a, an account from an actual industry uh, professional who talked about the fact that they actually burst into tears when they said that they were a game designer for the first time. And this was after they had designed many, many games. Um, so looking back on it, it was because I was female and I didn't feel like I was part of that world. I never, I never called myself a designer ever. And one of my colleagues was like, Briar, you need to say it out loud. I am a game designer. It was surprisingly difficult. I couldn't do it. And when I finally did, I cried because it's like, I am that I'm good enough to be that. So a lot of internalized oppression, a lot of feeling like you don't belong. A lot of the results of my study indicated that they felt out of place. I think this is another quote. I think recently there are more opportunities to find representative games and communities, but many of the problems are still in the old gatekeeping places, cons, shops, but online libraries, friends, et cetera, are doing a great job of creating online spaces. Okay. Um, you know, this was a note that somebody wrote to me in response to one of the presentations that I gave very recently, and they, they emailed it to me, and I cannot stop thinking about it. So I popped it in the presentation today. This person wrote me and said, I've been in board gaming for a long time. And, and while there are times that I won't say things because I don't want to draw attention to myself, I absolutely refuse to leave the room. Sometimes that's the only activism we have. Staying in the room can be a struggle. And I know that I've had that experience myself in my life um, where I stubbornly refuse to leave uncomfortable spaces because I want to be there for somebody who might want to come after me, you know, uh, in terms of being that person who can you know be that welcoming individual in the room who may feel out of place but i'm there for somebody who might want to might want to join me um so just staying in the room can be a real challenge for people wanting to engage with this hobby and this is a massive imperative um, for the entire industry and hobby when you consider that only 10 percent of the world's population is a white man and yet we've got this entire cultural exercise uh, pursuit that is over representing that particular identity. And that concludes my presentation. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yes, resonances already starting to form, connections already starting to form. So um, we will go ahead and move on to our last presenter for the panel. Last but not least, we have Leonid Magush uh, presenting Even Orcs Can Be Commoners. Take it away. Okay. Oh, 
Can you see the presentation? Yes, you just have to put it in Perfect. First of all, before I start, I would like to thank organizers for allowing me to attend this great conference, despite me being a citizen of Russia, and despite the fact that my country is currently launching a terrible invasion of, of a neighboring country. Uh, I grieve for those who lost their lives uh, during this shit storm. Sorry. Anyway, my presentation itself addresses the problem of using Dungeons and Dragons as a means of increasing cultural literacy and problems with that. Uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I opened the wrong text. Uh, here it is. Um, I'm currently at the beginning of the big research, and this presentation is a sort of call for help and suggestions. I want to discuss the problems of Dungeons and Dragons and cultural awareness. My research is based uh, on the concepts of procedural rhetoric by Jan Bogust, who have already been mentioned, I think, three times today. Uh, afford the concept of affordance is introduced to game studies by Lindsay Grace, who borrowed the idea from ecological psychology, and most of all, upon the idea of proto-story created by Hart and Koenitz. Uh, uh, Kunitz understood this term as a hypothetical set of all possible narratives supported by a specific game system. While this concept, as previous concepts, was first created for analysis of digital games, I believe that it can be used for tabletop RPGs as well, maybe even better so. Uh, through the process of the player's engagement with the narrative system, with the, for example, system of rules, uh, by choices and other behaviors, a concrete and personal narrative product is in stage shape is instantiated uh, on the basis of this proto-story. The relative ease of instantiating specific narratives within the given rules and signs referencing particular elements of what Daniel Kirby called the fantastic milieu makes it possible to classify those narratives as form of game interpretations uh, using Stuart's whole idea of preferred oppositional and negotiated reception of media. This makes it possible to talk about the ideology of a specific tabletop role-playing game without losing sight of the interactive, improvised, and freeform nature. Uh, it should be noticed that games can be perceived uh, on two different yet interconnected levels, which I call reading and co-creation. The first one simply implies the ability to interpret a particular narrative for specific scenes, stories, and characters uh, created as part of the tabletop RPG game. In the same way, we read and interpret different non-interactive texts like books and movies and comic books. The co-creation um, imply the preferred negotiated or positional use of rules in order to create a specific situation in the game world based upon some sort of reason, a previous type of interpretation. I won't uh, repeat what is written on slide. I, I believe everyone can easily uh, read it and understand my idea. By considering stories and characters that D&D allows to instan instantiate using uh, ways of reading and co-creation encoded as preferred, it is easy to notice that this game creates a number of very problematic procedural statements some already mentioned today. Many of them, are so, but what I want to focus on is that many of them are so ingrained into this game that even researchers and activists uh, trying to correct those problems unconsciously, unconsciously reproduce them, thus naturalizing them even further. Uh, I would like to focus on five of those problematic statements. Uh, well, capitalism is obviously the first. Despite the fact that rule books do mention an alternative, the game of D&D obviously encodes capitalistic monetary exchange as a default and universal way of simulating the economy. 
Monetary operation and monetary values framed as an objective characteristic of particular objects and services unite the entire universe in a single chain of supply and demand, connecting act of killing monsters rewarded by money and uh, clearly, definitely appraised valuables, buying implements of said killing, and spending money on personal whims, uh, which are supposed to reflect the tastes and ideals of player characters and obviously players themselves. This naturalization of capitalism exists on three levels. The level of DM, the level of players, and the level of characters. First, it is harder for DM to instantiate a narrative set in a world organized in a different way. Uh, believe me, I tried. Uh, Second, it is hard for a, particular play, for a particular players to ignore or undermine the capitalistic logic of the game, even if they want to. And third, it is harder to instantiate a consistent story of a specific in-world character who would be excluded from or opposed to capitalist economy. In fact, fifth edition of D&D takes even one step further than previous version of the game because uh, fifth edition tones down hints and narrative signs, uh, which implied that some classes like monks and paladins should avoid accumulating wealth at all. Uh, there was there are basically no mention of this now. Secularism as a separation of church and state and a relegation of religion uh, to the private life. Uh, threefold approach mentioned previously uh, I, uh, on the levels of DM player and characters provide a model for naturalization of other concepts like secularism. While d, d is obviously full of gods, priests, and religiously inspired monsters, the preferred decoding of its rules create an image of hyper-secular world with a plethora of religious organizations separated from the state on any level, coexisting and competing with each other like some sort of brands, with theocracies of different scales being an extremely popular antagonists. Um, Following a religion in such a world means, first of all, to follow its particular ethical code and not, for example, to participate in its ritual or to make pilgrimage. Uh, more importantly, those codes, uh, in case of many default religions in D&D, differs very little from non-religious forms of acceptable behavior, thus making it extremely easy to create a story of a character whose religious views would be completely private. Uh, and no one would actually know that this character is religious at all, not to mention to which religion the character belongs, an uh, ideal secular situation. <laughs> um, this is sort of words and weighted by me, sorry. Uh, urbanocentrism, uh, classes and backgrounds in D&D &D encode their position between nature and culture as fundamental for game world. Easiest interpretation of the most backgrounds from D and D core book puts their preferable habitat in the cities and towns, while nature is introduced through backgrounds of hermit, which directly provides the affordances for creating an opposition between uh, nature where hermit lives and uh, culture from which hermit uh, left, uh, and outlander. A, back a background encompassing all different types of people who supposedly feel at home in the wilderness, whatever that means, uh, starting from hunters to members of uh, primitive tribes. I I again, sorry for using such language. We, we, I hope everyone here understands what I'm trying to say. Um, all of this naturalizes the idea of fundamental division between civilization and wilderness, where players have to choose a particular site with urban civilization being the default mode of the existence, uh, suited for most of classes and backgrounds, and wilderness presented through specifically dedicated classes, backgrounds, and to a less extent races, serving as a big other. Uh, first problematic for me statement is pseudo-medievalism, uh, to which the previous statement strongly corresponds. The preferred decoding of D&D &D assumes that despite superficial Western medieval aesthetic, the game worlds should and would include modern social institutions and ideas whenever possible. Uh, 
Through the descriptions of backgrounds and classes, the game encodes the existence in basically uh, every game world, since I'm talking about uh, player's handbook, the base rulebook for the game. The game encodes the existence of standing armies, police, uh, reimagined as guards, modern types of prisons and crime, universal literacy, and so on. Specific adventures and settings at newspapers, psychiatric asylums, and so on and so on to the mix. I would like to emphasize that we are not talking about some accidental mistakes. This is a fairly consistent logic, encoding the specific approach to the world building and role playing is preferable. Aesthetic and physical impossibility to include some uh, modern institutions in the medieval world, impossibility which can be easily mitigated by magic, are the only things keeping such an approach in check. And uh, all of this leads to a consumerism being a default, basically, worldview in the and the game encodes uh, from the very beginning uh, that any object and service that can possibly exist can be bought uh, as long as you have enough money with very little attention paid to social or, for example, metaphysical considerations. Despite heavy borrowing of terms and imagery from occultism and religion, D&D uses both divine and arcane magic as a form of technology, completely free from uh, any constraints. Uh, this consumerist approach influences the game design itself, with underlying assumptions that characters and stories consist of discrete and interchangeable elements, which can easily be combined, separated, and reconnected, as long as you have access to necessary books. All of this uh, made uh, D&D uh, proto-story a very overt metaphor for Western urbanized post-industrial society. Guards take the role of the police, magic fills the niche of science and engineering, capitalism run rampant, and any social institution and ideas, whether good or bad, that do not exist in modern Western society, like hereditary nobility or religious identity instead of ethnical identity, are excluded, distorted, or toned down. DD becomes a tool of naturalization of Western urban civilization as a default mode of life. Even settings like, settings like Planescape, famous for its weird aesthetic and stories, follow this logic, in fact, taking it further. In Planescape, the world is completely secularized, with gods being simply other characters. Mon monetary exchange funny, finally becomes a constant throughout the entire multiverse, while the central base for the game is a city resembling weird, but at the same time, very recognizable modern megapolis with police, charities, prisons, asylums, and consumerist economy. What is especially worrisome here for me is that very often even scholars and activists aiming at criticizing and correcting problematic aspects of DD, &D, like its outlook on race or violence, adhere to this general logic of DD &D being a metaphor for post-industrial Western society. For example, many attempts at correcting the problem of DD &D and racism uh, aim at creating this image of completely rationally blind fictional worlds on both narrative and procedural level. This approach is, of course, empowering empower and, and deserve of praise. But at the same time, it serves as another step in the direction of complete naturalization of Western post-industrial society as the only type of society worth talking about at all. Its ills and problems, as well as the ways to solve those ills and problems, completely universalized. Uh, this happens despite the fact that even inside Western societies, we can easily find millions of people for whom specific statements I mentioned before are not natural. This reminds me of the idea of Claude Levistros about understanding progress as success in the assessment system set by a particular culture, which is presented as an objectively existing level of development. I believe that the lack of reflection on this fundamental Western centrism, even actually USA-centrism USA of DND squanders the potential uh, of uh, this game and through it of uh, mainstream role-playing industry in making the world a better place. Because for me, this potential lies, first of all, not in the ability to create empowering images, because this can be done through non-interactive media, 
uh, but in the ability to make comprehensive procedural statements about difficult topics and to provide players with different perspective, perspective helping them to dive in other cultures, religions, and worldviews. Unfortunately, many games, many game designers, and sometimes even activist projects aren't actually aimed at promoting tolerance using those affordances provided by DD. Uh, but at claiming that differences between uh, cultures, religions, and worldviews are actually not real. This is a very problematic outlook, especially since in conjunction with preferable decoding of base DMZ proto story, it does not simply says anyone could become anything. This would be a nice thought. But instead, it says anyone could become anything as long as said anyone agrees to live in accordance with specifically Western, secular, capitalistic, urban, and consumerist society. Thank you very much. I would be glad to answer any question, and I would be really glad to, to you know, contact anyone or jump in some on some project since game studies community in my home country is very small, and I'm afraid will be getting smaller. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's amazing and great. And again, uh, day two is killing it with the like everybody's on time, um, and we didn't have to like be grouchy, <laughs> which is awesome. So uh, presenters, if they want, if you want to be on screen, great. Uh, we'll open this up to Q&A about half an hour. Um, so if you have questions, go ahead and type the, them into the Q&A. Um, and, uh, but I'm just gonna go ahead and just start us off while we wait for questions to come in. Um, Izzy, did you wanna start us with a question? I would love to. So, everyone's presentation, amazing job. And I, I'm just caught up in the conceptualization of fantasy as like no harm. And I think that assumptive logic that I've seen kind of across the board of, that everyone has been pushing back on on these various panels um, requires a type of recognition. And I'm just wondering how you all find the definition of fantasy like locating identity and like if is if that makes sense <laughs> i realize it's a very convoluted question but i'm just thinking through fantasy as being equated like if you think about something as basic as disney as no harm right the characters never die they just right end. like fun or yeah and, by the magic circle yeah and just how you see that rhetoric even manifesting with the players as they come to the game, like accepting that there is no harm and that it becoming dangerous. And yeah, I can stop talking now. <laughs> I, I really like that question, Izzy, um, a lot. And it, it's, it's not on my wheelhouse, but I, I do think that that, that is a, a really, and uh, Leonid, you, you, you did a, such a good job there talking about the fact that we have a tendency to do the things that are sort of well-worn pathways in our brains. And we tend to accept things at face value and we create those things that we can understand. And I, you know, I'm a, I wrote a very ragey essay about how there is no sort of thing as a magic circle, um, no such beast uh, at all ever. Um, and that, I think that's such an interesting question. I, I'm just chiming in because I think it's fascinating. You know, the, this idea that, you know, in the metagame, like when we're actually gaming, it's not a, a penalty free, you know, harmless kind of an encounter. We're trying to indicate that we have, you know, there, you can do over and you, there's, there's no death necessarily in a lot of games and you're saved from that. But there's still a lot of violence and a lot of those recursive tropes in games. And I just I, I love the question a lot and I'm not I'm not even coming close to answering it, but I think it's such a fertile area of exploration and I love the question. Maybe you can repeat it. I think I I, I, I kind of misunderstood something about the question. I don't know. It's definitely the way I framed it. It's just how do you see the understanding of fantasy affecting how people engage with the games that you all have studied? Um, like the expectation that this space is supposed to be consequenceless, for lack of a better word, but there are, it's full of consequences, right? Um, emotional, you know, even even the division between fantasy and reality. Like I feel like that's a type of consequence, right? Like you can do certain things here, 
supposedly that you can't do in the real world, but then you're bringing the real world into a fantastic space that doesn't allow you to um, negotiate things that you think you should be able to, or perhaps you're trying to. So again, not sure if that actually clarified <laughs> my question, but it's just how do you see fantasy affecting players play? I feel like this whole day has been kind of about those issues, right? Either from the literally the safety of going to play somewhere in the public um, or consenting to, you know, certain kinds of erotic or sexual, you know, um, mechanics, or even how do you teach or what the expectations are. So like these questions of like playing a game for us ev evinces all sorts of things. And for some people, it isn't always going to be fun, safe, you know, safe, all those sorts of stuff. I do not think actually it would be always safe for all people. Uh, I think every person can encounter something unsafe as part of game. It's just that uh, games are, um, especially mainstream games, are so hardwired to cater to, let's say, it, very specific audience uh, that, yes, uh, in practice, thousands of people can live uh, entire life and feel like all they do is play D and Z without ever feeling uncomfortable. But the only reason for this is because some people got paid a lot of money, so those people won't ever feel uncomfortable as part of the game uh, but in the end i mean obviously anything we do affects us and uh, i don't think uh, games here are in fact uh, are in such a unique position in comparison to i don't know movies and uh, they may be affecting us more but certainly not 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 less and uh, we're not talking about uh, problems of separation fantasy from reality in case of, I don't know, books. We clearly can make this division, but at the same time, we clearly understand that books affect us and they can scar us emotionally or they can inspire us and so on. If I understand the question, sorry, maybe I, I, I didn't. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, Danielle in the chat asks, uh, and if you want to come swing back around to this, I'm going to ask the question and then you do what you with it. Uh, to Tanya and Julia, for those of us who host games in public spaces like libraries, uh, from y'all's experience and discussions during your research, what kinds of things do you think we can do to make that space more welcoming and safe? So this continues this conversation. Uh, I want to answer this. Um, um, and. I was thinking about that because, you know, my research was so, um, so much pointing in this direction that um, we need to make those spaces safe, but how do we do that? And I think for public gaming spaces, it would be quite easy to make like smaller spaces. You know, if you, if you think of a standard game store, it is one big space probably where you, where you go to play and there's many tables and um, it's it's quite loud if there are many people. And um, if you could somehow make this space smaller, like have private tables, have like more a diner kind of feel where there's walls so you don't necessarily see other people, um, that would feel just safer for the people at the table. I think that's such a great answer. And, you know, I think about this a lot. Um, one of the things that I uncovered uh, in one of the sets of stories that I got from the enthusiasts who participated in my research is there, and there's some really interesting innovations like uh, pre questionnaires, like a pre a pre event survey, right? Um, asking people about their needs and requirements and accessibility requirements and what they're looking to get out of the the event, a level of sophistication and sort of gating, like, you know, a, a game night and getting information about the people that you're, you're, you're bringing into the game, uh, the game store or the, the library event is really, really important. And it's also trying to do some um, perspective taking and empathy. Lots of people shared stories about being, you know, wandering into a church basement 
true story uh, from one of the respondents and saying like, I felt so out of place. I was the only woman there. I was the only person of color there. I felt really, really alone. I'm never going to forget that feeling that this person indicated. And they changed everything about the way they approach games as a result of just having that perspective, right? And often we don't think about, you know, all the literacies you need to game. There's so, it's a multiplicity of literacies. Um, and you have to, it's like starting a conversation, you're, you're like wandering into a friend group and they're telling all of these stories about things they did years ago. And you were like, what are you even talking about? I'm not read into the lore. I don't understand the mechanics. And so many people like actually walked away from gaming um, in, in more mainstream ways because they had such a lousy experience with people feeling like they didn't belong there or they were ignored at the table. It's, you know, going to a, a game night and being too slow on the uptake and getting, you know, kind of all the nonverbals and verbals saying, you know, you, you don't belong here. Um, so that's a huge problem for board gaming. And so perspective taking is so important to think about all the things somebody who's brand new and terrified might need. Yeah, and I think it's important to think about like conferences like this or even classrooms or whatever, people starting to sort of create these kinds of like house rules or, you know, um, uh, agreements. But then, of course, like teaching people how to deal with things when they come up is also its other side. Um, I do I do a lot of thinking in terms of like, you know, diversity and inclusion and DEI stuff at the university level. And like, I like this shift from rather than thinking about things as safe spaces, but naming them as anti-racist spaces or, you know, anti-phobic spaces. And so those are very different things because, you know, safety gets co-opted by, you know, really ne'er-do-wells really easily. Uh, Chandler, did you want to add anything or what you were thinking you had like started talking in and I could <laughs> Uh, well, I had a point about narrative and fantasy, but that might that moment might be past. Um, so. No, go for it. Go for it. Oh, yeah. Well, just that I think, and somebody touched on this, just that the, the point about, like, you know, from, from, like, a narrative theory perspective, like, there isn't really, like, a substantive difference between, like, a fantastical narrative and, like, a, a sort of a realist narrative, right? Like, and as many, many people have said in their talks, like, it is about the kinds of, um, the kinds of logics and assumptions that each, uh, that each encodes. And so, um, yeah, there is, like, a kind of extra level of, of, of literacy, um, and on, on both ends, right? On, like, on, like, manufacturing, creating those narratives, like, sort of intentionally pushing back against, you know, all of these narratives that we've received about like what kinds of goals we should be creating, what kinds of experiences we should be creating. Um, so I just think that it's it's cool to be here too, because there's a lot of like talk in the like literary theory space about how this kind of works on an abstract level, but not a lot of energy about actually implementing it anywhere. And so it feels, uh, it's like encouraging to actually see people sort of talking and thinking meaningfully about like the way that that these sort of processes actually happen in people's experiences in the real world. Um, and then I did just have a quick comment about the other one too, which is that um, it does seem like there's this really cool pedagogical element to like game spaces and creating welcoming game spaces. And so like when, when uh, you were talking Ed about your, your work in the university like that, I mean, a lot of that is like, you know, anti-racist pedagogical training and like those kinds of, um, those kinds of skill sets seem really transferable into this, um, into this goal of creating like, um, you know, safe spaces, welcoming spaces. Uh, Aaron, your hand is up. Yeah, this is such a wonderful panel. Thank you, everybody. Um, I have a question for Tanya and Julia. Um, so I, I kind of just want to give you a, an opportunity, a platform, more platform. Um, if, if someone was watching um, and they ran a game store or an event, um, and they were scratching their head and saying, how do I make this a more inclusive space? How do we make this a space that um, uh, lets anybody who comes in know that they're welcome here? What should they do? What, what, what are the things that they should, uh, should, should consider doing? I have so many uh, big feelings about this. Um, so one of the things I, I, I actually wrote a, a chapter on um, materiality um that talked a little bit about, about some of my first encounters with the uh, game spaces here in my now uh, new new city and uh, just exactly like julia's uh, story 
and it's interesting how we have to always scan everybody um, entering a space. Uh, everybody does it, and I think um, marginal, systemic, underrepresented, marginalized people do it more. Where I am always looking for safety signs. I am always hyper vigilant. So if I'm walking down a basement corridor, true story, uh, covered in um, semi nude and nude women, uh, it smells bad. Um, I see weird signs on the wall, things are pinned up on the, the community board that are uh, troubling and offensive. Um, there's like one bathroom there and the lock doesn't lock. Um, uh, you know, I am like, nope, 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 nope. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I got a lot of stories like that. And sometimes that one experience is enough to just go and nope out of the entire hobby. And that's that's what a lot and that's the big problem because what we've got is um, a vicious circle in vicious circles and vicious circles right with board gaming we got a closed stagnant community it's changing right it's thanks to the work that analog game studies does particularly it's changing but it felt like i was going back in time when i looked at board games right it felt like i was going back to the 70s um, with what i'm encountering here and so looking for things and getting somebody with a different perspective like game shop owners should be asking people do an audit of my store tell me my problems and listen to the people who tell you that um, and that's another big problem is they're not they're, you know it's working for us we're solvent we're breaking even we made a little profit last year we're go we're okay this this entire sector could be bigger this entire hobby could be way more massive, but it's being gate kept and kept stagnant by people who are like, well, it's not really broke. I like it here, right? I like my gaming space. Sure, no women come in here, but we're okay with that. And I think at some level, that's, that's sort of the default a little bit. They're not that curious about this. At least that's my, uh, my experience. I'll stop talking. I just wanted to start picking up at this and have Julia talk. Um, uh, someone wrote in the question a similar thing and maybe thinking about like, what are like specific fixes, right? Like doing that audit is a really great thing. Um, what can be actually implemented in the space um, it, instead of just throwing a label on the event as being safe? What are some of the things that we can do to actually make this believable or excited about that, that event? Yeah, I think I can add to that. And um, I feel like one of the things is show me that you care. Like the person that is um, uh, working in the game store, the owner, the people that are uh, employed there, they have to like just, as Tanya already said, um, be present and notice if something goes uh goes down the hill and then also address that like immediately and um if that results in kicking that person out that has to happen because otherwise i don't feel safe and i'm not coming back and i also think um because i i reflected on my my um first game store experience i think it was such a nice experience because the game store owner is a woman and i think she just noticed um misbehaving people and spoke about that and then i could feel safe even though i was very new to the hobby and did not know what to expect and it was a nice basement but it was a basement and <laughs> it was still it, it felt safe so i think it's just the atmosphere that you are able to provide um, is so important that's that's the other big problem that that julia just uh just nailed um this entire sector needs different they need they need they need new ideas they need you know it's it's a it's a little mom and pop shop ish in the board gaming sector there's some market consolidation and you know there's some professionalization but i think they still haven't really gotten the memo that um, you're 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 heading down a path that is actually sort of stunting, ruinous. Um, will keep this hobby small and stagnant. 
Um, and a little bit of like, if it's not broke, don't fix it. We've been doing this for decades. What do you know about this? Um, and 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 if you if you hire for diversity, um, make sure that the the people that you hire for that diversity are psychologically safe enough that they can tell you what's wrong with the space and listen to them when they say it and change it right away. And if there's people in your space that are, you know, dehumanizing, demeaning, threatening, they need to go. They have to go because that is keeping your entire space small, stagnant. And frankly, you know, um, you'll end up on the, uh, the trash heap of history if you, if you allow that to continue. Awesome. Other questions? I'm gonna I guess ask. I, I a, go ahead, go ahead, go for it. Sorry, yeah, I just have a really quick question, I guess, also for Tanya and Julia about um, like research methods and um, thinking about connecting some of the empirical stuff to some of the like, um, I guess more like textual or, or interpretive or, or, or analytical stuff. I don't know, because y'all's work, with, you know, we're, we're both survey based in, in empirical studies, which is awesome. And I'm just curious if you're interested in what kinds of bridges can sort of be built between our fields, because that's obviously not what I do, but I think it's really cool. And I'd like to sort of find ways to get those bodies of work to like talk to each other a little bit better. Um, curious if you have any thoughts on that. It's such a good question. Um, you know, I'm haunted by one thing, though, with uh, online surveys. I only get the people who fill them out. And, I, and it, a lot of people point out, you know, like, what about the people who you really like, what about the people who hate board gaming for reasons? Like, how do you how do you locate them? Right. It's such a difficult thing. Um, online surveys are only as good as the people you can actually get to participate in them. Um, so it's so challenging, but it's because we're there's so little data. There's so little data, like to try and find a census of board gamers. There have been some fits and starts of this, but clearly there's not a lot of curiosity from a market perspective to actually get that census of gamers. That in my, my, my work is not a census of board gamers. Is board gaming super diverse? You betcha, but it's so hard to locate folks and that's a big, big challenge. And I think something that we are all going to have to figure out and tackle because we don't even really have a good sense of what is the current state. Like who's playing board games? Like everybody, everybody's playing board games potentially, but finding that data is so hard. Um, Leonid, you have a question? Yeah, I have a very simple question. Chandler, how can we follow your project? Because I really, really want to show it to my students. <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's very kind. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I don't currently have it up anywhere, but uh, if you want to uh, send me an email, I'm happy to share uh, all of my materials. I put this in the Discord, um, but I believe really strongly in like an open sharing model of scholarship. Um, so I'm very, very not protective of my work and my material. Um, none of it's published yet. Um, maybe one day I hope that it will be, but, um, but in the meantime, I would love anybody to take a look at it. And um, if it sparks some ideas, great. And uh, if not, then that's also fine. So um, yeah, emailing me is the best way. Thank you. And also, Leonid, oh, just sorry, just to just to go back to you, Leonid, I also am really interested in speaking with you about um, about religion in, in the game space, because um, I do work a lot on, on religious formations and politics uh, in sort of non game texts. And so I'm interested in seeing if like what what sorts of um, conversations can be had around that as well. I would be happy. Great. Amazing. Amazing. Last questions or thoughts? I'm I'm all for, you know, cutting out a teeny bit early. I think, you know, we're all, we all need a little recharge, but. If it's okay, I just have more of a comment than the question to Julia, because it's just very funny since from Russian perspective, Germany looks like, you know, this mecca of ultra tolerant, open, uh, diverse uh, place, this place uh, like ideally suited for tabletop gamers and so on. And it's just somewhat disheartening to, to, to hear about all of this. 
sorry to uh, destroy your your fantasy there. <laughs> uh, it's okay. Yeah, but it's it's really like it is still a board game space, and it still has all the problems that Tanya illustrated that we heard before. Also, the the problems that we just have in general society with the misogyny at the gaming table and whatever. So yeah it is it is a big market for for board games yes but who's making the games like and who are they making the games for and i'm always pleased to do that for canada as well leonid um in insofar as i anyone who follows me on twitter uh, is is immediately disabused of the fact that you know canada is the world's nicest place to live so just <laughs> follow me on twitter leonid and uh yeah you'll be able to see me uh, gripe about um, all the all the problems here. Amazing. I feel like that's a terrible place to stop, but um, I, I, maybe I'll recover it by saying I think all of this work uh, uh, for the conference in, in total and all of the work that people do, whether you're a developer, player, scholar, creative writer, whatever, is uh, one of the things that was running through all these four papers is about this reimagining of of gaming or game spaces, um, reimagining of like who gets to play, you know, who stories are told. Um, and uh, and I always, you know, I'm always pushing, you know, going to like, you know, uh, as science fiction, speculative fiction of color, particularly written by women of color, um, because we're starting to see some of those answers or we've already seen the answers and they're coming true, you know, um, and so you know, Octavia Butler, uh, N.K. Jemison, uh, all those folks. Um, so awesome. Well, I'm going to call it. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to stop recording here.